恭请大德上听，为此发挥几切众生，请转妙法轮，教导我们。如何了生脱死，离苦得乐，速证无生。唯有了三纲，为归于 out of compassion for this assembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to live suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize number. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi Sanmiao Sanputoshe. Namo Sadanto Suche Duye Alahadi Sammyao Samputo Se Wushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yen Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gowei Shishung, Dajia, Amito Fo, Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shir. Today is Sunday, July 24th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, Saturday, July 23rd, back in California. We are about to look into the next several praises. From the ten bodhisattvas in the palace of a Suyama heaven, as they are celebrating the Buddha's、uh, arriving to to speak Dharma, and in order to get our lecture underway, we're going to do an invocation to invite the Buddhas and bodhisattvas of the ten directions, three periods of time, particularly the. The Flower Garland Assembly, the gods, the dragons, the Eightfold Pantheon. So we have high hopes, high expectations, and it works if you're sincere. So let let me see if I can get my sincerity sufficient. Here we go.
those uh, ringing tones from my Ashoka banjo by Fabrizio Alberico. Here we go. Uh, we like to acknowledge the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language group who practice their spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and to all creation here in this location for tens of thousands of years. Today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land. We acknowledge them with gratitude as we share the land, with sorrow for the costs of the sharing, and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom, their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all First Nations peoples whose sovereignty was never ceded. All right. Welcome again, everybody. Uh, we're looking into the uh, verses in praise in a palace of the Suyama heaven. And to catch everybody up, this is the Flower Garland Sutra. It's a big Buddhist text. And it's divided into seven places where the Buddha explained the sutra nine times, twice in two places. And along the path, he traveled to a heaven above our realm, um, above the heavens, yeah, we won't, let's not do that today. He traveled to a palace in the heavens called the Suyama, the, the heaven where time is well divided, they call it. Uh, and in that palace, the Buddha explained the Dharma of the Ten Practices chapter, and also a teaching on something called the Ten Inexhaustible Treasuries, treasuries that never run out. So those two particular teachings were explained in this palace. And as things got underway, the, the god in charge there, the deva in charge of the Siyama heaven, um, cleaned out his palace, prepared it, uh, made a seat suitable for the Buddha. And when the Buddha came up, the, the deva um, circled him, bowed, and uh, knelt, knelt down and did his own praises. But the surprising thing was he said, you're not the first Buddha to come here. There have been uh, ten, ten Buddhas that he remembered in his own memory. And he, he told their names and said, wow, to bring the Buddha here is the most auspicious. Zhu uh, Ji Xiang, Zhong Zui Ji Xiang. This is the most auspicious among the, the various uh, visitors who could ever come to your home. Uh, so, as they say, uh, the spirit will not abide where all is not clean. So where all is clean, the spirit can abide. So it's important to, for us to prepare a clean place. And of course, where would that be? Well, it's a building somewhere in the heavens, but it's more importantly, it's my mind, your heart, where we want things to be clean so the spirit, the Buddha, can abide. So that's what the Deva did. Then the next thing that happened was 10 Bodhisattvas showed up. And... They are, uh, we, we learned about them. They have the same name. The Buddhas where they come from are named the same. The lands where they come from are named the same, but they come from all different directions, which is an Avatamsaka state for sure. Different directions, but something similar going on, something identical going on in every place. So they, we learned that about them. And uh, then the leader of the 10, whose name is Gong De Lin, a bodhisattva's name is Forest of Merit and Virtue. He starts to speak. And we just finished listening to his 12 verses in praise. Think um, we do have a, something equivalent. We got hip hop, uh, where uh, people inspired by the spirit just start to uh, rhyme spontaneously, outcome the verses. And uh, so, Forest of Merit and Virtue sings his, he chants them. Now, we've come to the second Bodhisattva, his name is uh, Hui Lin Pusa, Forest of Wisdom. And he's, last week we heard his first two, his first two praises. So, I'm going to uh, hydrate, 
prepare myself to present to everybody. See, I get uh, I get to be the channel for these verses to come through me to all of you, and uh, I had a I had a an awareness this week. I stumbled upon on uh, a video archive which included Hoot Nanny. Anybody there old enough to remember the TV show called Hoot Nanny? It was short-lived, but it was aimed at the folk music boom, we called it. Uh, there was a time in the 60s when folk music, American folk music, was suddenly what the cool kids were listening to. It was my age. That was when I came, uh, I, I got a Hitachi uh, portable radio, which only got AM stations, and you put a 9-volt battery in it. And Oh, I was so thrilled to have, to be able to listen to CKLW from Detroit. Oh, and from Detroit, we were listening to Motown and WTOL in Toledo, Ohio, and all of those uh, radio stations, my little radio, my little handheld uh, AM radio could get. And, and with that, I was launched into the world of musical sounds and used my ear organ to interact with the world beyond my house, my neighborhood, my school, my friends in Toledo, Toledo, Ohio. So to uh, when I heard Peter, Paul, and Mary singing If I Had a Hammer on AM radio, climbing the charts, something changed. The, I, I tr moved from being a consumer of recorded sounds to a participant. The thing about the folk music deal uh, at the time was if you picked up a guitar, you were part of the movement. You didn't have to be, you didn't have to have access to a studio, you didn't have to play drums, you didn't have to move your hips like Elvis Presley, you didn't have to have a back, backup singers like uh, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. You could sing your own song. And the songs came out of the ground. The songs came from the land and from the generations of mostly European my people, Irish, Scottish heritage people who had come to America centuries before and had uh, some settled into the Appalachians, some came west and became cowboys, some went south and, and uh, learned about the music of the south. And, but there, there it was. There was the flow of folk music and you could pick up a guitar and be part of it. And I heard that and something went zowie. So it moved me to find friends who could teach me how to play a guitar and how to sing those songs. And at the time, this is the 1960, would be 64, 65, um, a TV show came on to capitalize on the popularity of folk music, and the TV show was called Hootenanny, Hootenanny, which was, of course, a new word for most people, probably still is, but it means a time when you come together to, to celebrate music and poetry, particularly uh, grassroots, old-time folk music, and I did, and that song, the, that TV show, black and white television, um, I forget the host, David Linkletter was his name, Art Linkletter's son, and he went to college campuses around the country and had invited in folk singers, and the students were sitting there listening and singing along, and that was me, that was my generation. So a hootenanny was when the music came through, and I saw on this video my very favorites of all time, which was Ian and Sylvia, a folk duo from Toronto, Ontario, and people who I patterned myself after. And uh, now we haven't touched the sutra yet. I'm still in the intro here, so be patient there. You, you who are listening for the sutra. <laughs> I should probably tell my stories after the sutra, but I'm getting us ready to listen. The, the thing about the hootenanny was that anybody could you were welcome. 
and the line between audience and performer was pretty thin, especially when the performers would say, everybody sing along. So let's all sing along. So, the Hootenanny, a place where you celebrate the music, the folk music. In uh, If you play the Chinese Gu Qin, you come together for a Ya Ji. A Ya Ji is a celebration of traditional Chinese folk music, which goes back, you know, thousands of years. Well, in America, we don't have thousands of years of, of history to celebrate. Uh, we do have the music that comes from uh, Europe, which has a much longer history. But there we were, uh, singing folk songs. And were they part of our heritage? Not necessarily. Uh, many of the songs had roots in the African-American tradition, particularly the experience of slavery and, and labor and the suffering of that experience, uh, which was healed by the singing. So for a middle-class white kid from Toledo to sing songs coming out of the plantations in the South was artificial. But we learned. We learned about the process, and it became ours. And the thing about the folk tradition is you make it yours. You add your, your, uh, your way of understanding it, your way of hearing it, and you contribute to it, and it flows forward to the next generation. Okay, are you ready for the shift? We are now doing that for Buddhist wisdom. This is the flip over. The I'm uh, our sutra lecture is a Dharma Hootenanny. Okay, we are sharing. Uh, I'm the the line between observer and audience and participant. Uh, into singer of the songs. So that's what we got in this chapter. Okay, all right, all right, no worries. Okay, so um, technical issues with computers, that's how it goes. We be patient. So, um, Let's take a look at our text today. Here we go. Actually, no problem. Good. Glad to hear it. We have who? We have Hui Lin Pusa, Wisdom Forest, Forest of Wisdom Bodhisattva. And here's what he's saying. We're on his third song, his third verse, third verse of his praises. And he goes like this. He goes, Rulai Chu Shi Jian, Wei Shi Chu Chi Ming, Ru Shi Shi Jian Dang, Xi O Nan Ke Jian. And in English, it would go something like this The Tathagata appears amid the worlds and dispels the dark of ignorance for us all. In this way, we see the lamp of the world, so rare and difficult to meet. That's the new melody. Okay, so look at this. He's saying praise, right? This is a praise. This is a zan, zan tan, rulai. The Tathagata appears amid the worlds and dispels. Oh, 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 you know what? I didn't share my screen. I should know better. Here we go. Here we are. Yay. I'll get that down. The Tathagata appears amid the worlds and dispels the dark of ignorance for us all. In this way, we see the lamp of the world, so rare and difficult to meet. Mm. It's a hootenanny. This is a Dharma hootenanny. Uh, or passing on the folk music of my people, the sounds of my people. 
but these my people includes every living being with wings and you can hear the doves right outside my window they are the last ones to come and clean up all the the bird seed that the other birds left behind good for them the buddha appears amid the worlds and chases away the dark of ignorance for everybody <coughs> in this way we get to see him he's called shi jindang he's rare it's hard to meet the buddha um, but when we do um, what would be the ignorance of the world the dark of ignorance um, I'll share one. Uh, climate disruption is a scare for most of us. Anybody listening tonight in Europe um, has folks there have gone through um, the, the hottest days of history, of human recorded history in England, for example. There are fires burning in France. There are fires burning in Spain, fires in Italy. Um, the European continent is sweltering under heat. America, I saw a, a map of America with the temperatures pasted on every state, every major city. Everything is over 80, except the Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, which is always cold in San Francisco. But... We've broken the climate, and people look to bigger authorities because it's a big problem. It's a problem that affects every human and every creature alike. And the bigger authorities don't have an answer because various reasons, um, mostly because a lot of money is generated by pumping oil out of the ground. Oil is like the blood of the earth. And when we pump it out and then set it on fire to power our vehicles and to we pump it out of the ground and turn it into plastics and all the things that come out of oil, an amazing amount of the products in the world that we consume had their basis in the earth's blood which is oil, shiyol, rock oil in Chinese. And because it's so profitable, nobody wants to stop, even if it means we destroy the planet. Proof of that is the first days of the pandemic back in early 2020, when people quarantined worldwide everything changed. The animals returned. There was a noticeable lessening of carbon in the atmosphere because we weren't out on the streets burning the fuel, burning the oil. Okay, so we know that one. Here's the one that Buddhists pick up on worldwide that other folks don't seem to be willing to talk about, which is if we wanted to make carbon and methane deposits in the atmosphere, cut it by two thirds, more than half, the best thing to do would be to stop animal agriculture. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody talks about it. So for the Buddhists to shake their fists and say, stop killing animals for food. It'll save the planet. People laugh. They laugh. That's even, there's one particular political party in America who attacks the one politician who is bold enough to say that. And they say, oh, she's coming for your cows. She's coming for your hamburger. And they laugh because they know that people won't take it seriously. So that's the truth. That's the darkness of the world. That the Buddha's wisdom lamp 
is able to dispel. And the Buddha comes along and says, mm, if you kill a lot of cows and eat their flesh, you can become a cow in the future because that's just the way it works. There, the hatred, the anger generated by killing is universal. Nobody wants to donate their body for your lunch, for your dinner. So why don't we acknowledge that and say, how can I eat in a way that doesn't involve creating, generating that kind of hatred and animosity? That, as Master Hua talked about it, he said that killing karma uh, fills heaven and earth and doesn't disperse. You know the verse. It goes, Qian bai nian lai wan li gong yuan shen si hai hen nan ping yu zhi shi shang dao bing jie qie wen tu men ye ban sheng So, ru guo ni xiang zhi dao zhe ge ta shuo uh, should I translate? The, let me see if I can. Should I find it? Let's find it now. Because this is, we're talking about what? We're talking about the darkness that the Buddha's light dispels. So, um, stop killing. Let's see if we can find that quickly. I've got it here on my... There we are. We've got it right there. Let's see if it comes up. Oh, not that one. Sorry. Uh, Chen Bai Nian Lai. Let's search for that one. Chen. Search, search in Chinese. Can you all search in Chinese on your computer? Chen Bai Nian Lai. Let's see if it comes up with that. Um, Have we got it? Uh, here we go. Okay, there it is. Yes, here we are. Okay. Show you how this works. This is uh, powerful. Okay, what's our point? Our point is we want to understand this verse. Here we go. The verse in the sutra says that the Tathagata comes to uh, dispel the darkness of the world, and we call him the, uh, the lamp of the world, the lamp that lights up the world. So take a look here. I've got a poem that goes like this. For countless years the bitter stew of hate was boiling on. Its vengeful broth is ocean deep, impossible to calm. To learn the cause of so much conflict, terror, hate, and war, listen to the cries at midnight by the butcher's door. Take a look here. Qian bai nian lai wan li gong, yuan shen si hai hen nan ping, yu zhi shi shang dao bing jie, Here's the image, and in the center we've got butchers killing a pig, getting ready to turn him into what? Pork chops, bacon, oh, don't take my bacon away, ah, oh, ham hocks, what else? Christmas Easter pork, Easter ham, right? All those products, we give them nice names because... We like to eat them in different ways, but it's a living being. It's a pig. Very intelligent animals. And around the butchers are what? Are scenes of, of a, a pitch battle. Warriors in battle. Fighting with swords. and You could swap them out with drones and, and uh, lasers, right? But they're, obviously, they're, they're killing each other. And the artist wants us to see the connection. And Master Hua was very clear about how that works. 
And he pointed it out in a way that I never understood until he said that what's going on is acts of killing um, don't disperse in the air. There's when, when we forcefully take the life of some creature, that energy, uh, what, what happens in the body of the creature who has been murdered or killed is the body, all of the different systems uh, flash this awareness that there's lethal harm coming to them. And the adrenals and the pituitaries and the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, all the different physical systems um, secrete hatred, fear, terror, and toxins that when something takes the body that has been forcibly killed and eats it, all those toxins go inside. And also, as, as Shirfu said, there's a, a chi, an energy of resentment <coughs> that is released into the world as well, released into the air. And at a certain point, that toxic energy boils over and cannot be simply blown away by the wind. And it returns as killing energy of warfare. And so the other uh, the the other byproduct, the other uh, when you say a result of those acts of killing is also, uh, well, let, let me step that back. There's another byproduct, which is when a 1,600-pound animal, nearly a ton of cow, um, is raised on a pasture, the cow emits gas out its rear end, out its tailpipe, methane, which is a uh, an oxygen-eating gas. It eats the ozone layer. Furthermore, in order to feed that huge animal, we have to cut down trees to make pasture for it, which, and the trees are the lungs of the planet. If our planet was still covered with the original forests, we wouldn't have the overheating that we're experiencing now. Um, it's definitely connected. And Trees cool the planet, and they also transform the carbon dioxide that we exhale into oxygen that we can inhale. And it, they, the tree's roots hold water and help hold the soil so that the water that falls in the form of rain doesn't flood. Um, just ask New Orleans. And so... The, uh, the other reality is that these huge animals that we, that are very sentient, whose DNA is just so much like ours in every way, who have thoughts and feelings and emotions and, and rules that they live by, they love their children, uh, they are social animals, they have structures that they observe in their interactions with each other, they're peaceful animals, and they require water to keep themselves hydrated and also the excrement that comes out of cows and sheep and all. Uh, when we, in the process of turning them into meat that we sell to eat, that excrement comes out and, and pollutes the land when it's around a feedlot or a slaughterhouse. So all these horrible, awful things I'm talking about are what they're all because people like that moment of flavor that hits your taste buds, go, mmm, that's good. And I love bacon, and I love lunch meat and sausage and all the things that we eat that are meat. And we forget the fact that it came from the body of a living creature. 
So I would hold up to you um, the story of Master Xu Yun, Master Empty Cloud. Our teacher lived to be 120 years old and never ate a hamburger from McDonald's, never ate a big burger, never ate pork chops or hong shao yu, red fried fish, or, you know, uh, uh, gambao ji, ji ding, uh, General Zuo, how is it? General Zuo's chicken, is that? So none of those things. I don't even have the language of, of meat eaters anymore these days. So he switched, he ate a vegetarian diet his whole life and lived to be long and stronger than most of us. So we can do it, but we have to give up a little bit of burst of flavor. But then once it passes our throat, it doesn't taste good anymore. Once it goes down into our body, it turns into things that we don't want to eat. So we lose so much to gain so little. And if we can give up a little bit of flavor, oh my goodness, there's major, major investments now in mock meat burgers. Hmm, Impossible Burgers. Yeah, they're uh, the uh, it's working. It's working. People are preferring now hamburgers that didn't come from a, a cow. So I'm going to say, and I'll finish my tirade here, my rant, um, that when we talk about the, the Tathagata, let's take a look at our at our text now. Come back to our text. Here we go. Uh, if I hit that, we should get all of it. Close this. And there we go. Here's our text. How does it go? It said, Ru lai chu shi jian, wei shi chu chi ming. The chi ming is what we're talking about. Ru shi shi jian dang, xi yo nan ke jian. The Tathagata appears amid the worlds and dispels the dark of ignorance for us all. In this way, we see the lamp of the world so rare and difficult to meet. Um, I'm a Buddhist monk from the Chinese tradition here in Australia, talking to friends in America and around the world about a Buddhist text that has been in the world for a minimum 2,500 years. And I'm pointing out that the darkness the ignorance of the world that is dispelled by the lamp of the world comes down to choices that we make every day at the dinner table. If we want to really step into the flow of wisdom and compassion of this sutra and get the, the functioning of this, of the Buddha's incredible legacy, um, one really good place to start is to consider to look at our diets and say, how does this affect me? Maybe I could consider checking out the options that I have now. And what a privilege to be able to, to be able to, to switch. Um, I can see it uh, today. I've already here, I'm, I'm surrounded by so much life here in the Queensland bush. Um, I've stepped into, my, I've turned my deck, my balcony into a bird cafe. Uh, and already today, I've already fed six different species of birds. And among them, there, everybody loves the bird seed. We get, we get so much mileage out of the bird seed, and it's called parrot mix, and it comes in big 25-kilo bags. Uh, we're going through it faster and faster in the winter because everybody's eating more now. But there's one species amid those six kinds of birds that I fed today that is carnivorous, and that's the kookaburras. And the kookaburras are... They're beloved. They're a symbol of Australia. Uh, they're iconic, and they're cute. They're really, and they they have these wonderful laughs and personalities. And yet, they don't want birdseed. And the other birds give the kookaburras a lot of room 
Because why? Kookaburras eat baby birds. And they eat skinks, little lizards. And they eat big snakes. And they eat frogs if they can. And they're meat eaters. And of the other birds who eat the little seeds, they're peaceful. The parrots, king parrots, fly away. They're, they're not, they don't fight. You know, somebody wants to grab the food, they step back. You know, but oh my goodness, the kookaburras are meat eaters, and you can see the difference. They're heavyweights; they will stop your life. The parrots won't stop; they just want seeds. You know, the lorikeets are mean and nasty, but they're nectar eaters. They eat pollen and honey. So, my what a difference between species that eat the flesh of other species and those that live peacefully and finding alternatives. How wonderful to be able in my life to choose among uh, foods that are kind and harmless, ahimsa, no harm, and foods that are, that make other beings flee for their lives. Yeah, I choose, you know, I can, and I say that's a privilege and I'm lucky to be able to feed my body and nourish my body um, in a way that doesn't uh, that doesn't require me to stop the life of something else. Obs not learning that or turning a blind eye to that is the dark of ignorance. There's one. That's one. And climate scientists will tell us that if we can switch over to a harmless diet, we will be making our biggest individual contribution to climate disruption, to climate change. Okay, done with the rant. Sorry about that. Here we go. If I'm not going to say it, who's going to say it? <laughs> Well cultivated, giving precepts and patience, vigor and dhyana as well. He has cultivated prajna paramita, and with these he illumines the mundane. What do we have here? Paramitas. Wow, the whole, this is forest of wisdom bodhisattva who's saying, saying, yeah, look, paramitas, the Buddha cultivated them. Paramitas, what are they? Look, here's the first one, giving. Here's number two, precepts. Here's number three, patience. Here's number four, vigor. Here's number five, dhyana, chan. And number six, has a verse, all, a line all to itself. Prajna paramita, boro bolo mi. And with these, he illumines the mundane. Itsu zhao shi jian. The Buddha's light of wisdom uh, shines through the darkness of our own attachments and lights things up. And we go, oh, I see that the way I've never seen it before. Okay, um, today, I was so going over to feed the fish. We've got wonderful fish, goldfish, uh, who have grown very, very large, my goodness, in a short time. Uh, they're, they're not koi. Koi are illegal here in Australia because they're invasive. But they're uh, related, and they're... They've grown really big. And to get from where I'm sitting right now um, in the Queensland bush, um, not far from the Gold Coast, to over to where the goldfish live, I have to walk through the forest. I walk through the woods, the bush. And, oh my, this morning um, we've had uh, four days of heavy rain. And the ground is completely saturated, and the creek is running because the water level is so high. 
but yesterday it didn't rain and so everything is moist and damp and, and green and yet the the uh you can feel the storm is past the storm is over and so on my way over all the birds were singing and your skin feels um alive everything today as i was walking felt alive and uh singing about it and celebrating the fact that that uh The, in this case, the water was not destructive. The water was life-giving. And the sun, blue sky, and the sun warming everything. And it was just to be able to breathe in that fresh, green, moist air felt like a celebration. And I spontaneously, I thought, I'm so glad to be alive. And to be able to breathe without obstruction. Think of all the folks suffering with COVID who uh, this virus gets in there and chokes your, chokes your lungs and you drown because your body wants to get rid of it and produces a reaction to the virus. And the body can't, can't get rid of the, can't find its balance. And I didn't have that problem today and I felt so grateful that every breath was just coming in and taking every shibao, every cell in my body and just saying, you're alive. Cherish being alive. How lucky, how privileged you are. And the because I'm walking on dirt, it's a path through the woods. There's trees, a canopy overhead, and I, the sun is filtered down through it. It's, it's thick. We would, I would call it woods growing up in Ohio. So walking through the thick woods on a wooden, on a dirt path, uh, crossing over the creek twice to get there and, and uh, uh, running, walking past, I think, I haven't done a, a tree inventory, but I think there's 10 different kinds of trees, probably four species of gum trees, and, you know, uh, and then uh, there's mahogany and, uh, there's coniferous trees and some very special ones like tea trees and jacaranda trees, special to Australia. But the, the feeling that I had was that here in Australia, um, the human population density is the least of any developed nation. There's more room around each person, largely because the outback, which is just 50 miles, starts from where I am, 100 miles, uh, is essentially unpopulated, it's unlivable. And there, I'm on the coast. I'm just uh, 15 miles from, not that many, six, seven miles from, from the, the ocean, the Tasman Sea. And uh, if you go 100 miles, west of us you find desert and it's really dry over there but where we are here along the coast um, things are alive and humans haven't messed it up yet we've australia is losing many species the the record of this land in terms of extinction of species is not bright um, including koalas are going away. The number of koalas in this entire nation is now down in the tens of thousands. Um, from a time when, when the white people, when the white races first got here, uh, koalas were so common that they sent trains full of koala pelts that they had killed and skinned them and thrown them into boxcars, filling boxcars. There were that many originally here. Now they're down to, it's endangered. Koalas are on the way out. They may only exist in zoos uh, before too long. Anyway, um, this feeling of being invigorated by every breath 
and welcomed by everything else that was enjoying its life was so strong today. And I thought, how sad that we as a species come into these urban settings and pave everything over, including the rivers. Um, we confine the rivers into little tunnels and we seem to stamp out everything that is breathing and green and vibrant. And life is hard to find in an urban setting. And the thing that came to me next was, we're talking about, what was it? The second one of these perfections was uh, number two. There we go. Number two was precepts, right? How does it go? It goes, yi xiu jie shi shi jie. Already cultivated giving and precepts and patience. That precepts one, suddenly as I was walking through the woods today, I thought, what is it about the precepts? Is they're all life-giving? And when we break, though, if we start with the first five, in particular, when we break them, we are life denying. And the Buddha and sages of every religion give us precepts as the fundamentals of being a human in a life well lived. We can just tear through the world like a terror, destroying everything, and we're alive, but it's not a life well lived. The choices that are made for selfishness and consuming are so life-denying. But the precepts to give is to foster life, to not steal, is to allow everyone to have a share of material that fosters their lives. If I take it away from you, your life is threatened, is diminished. The relationships, relationships give us our lives. They make our lives uh, lived in community, supported and nurtured and nourished. So the precept against adultery and promiscuity protects life, life-giving. Adultery and promiscuity takes life away. The conditions that foster social life. Lying, dishonesty, it, it chokes life. When somebody lies to me, when somebody tells me something and then it isn't true, it creates the conditions that prevents my life from flourishing. And then this was the one that actually cued me in. As I was walking through the woods today, through the bush, on my way to feed the fish, um, I thought, how sad if I have, if I live in a place where I have taken away the stars, I've taken away the wind, I've taken away the ground, I've taken away the animals and the insects and the fish and the birds, and I've boxed myself in to a an environment that has just a ceiling, a floor, and walls, and I can beat darkness with a flick of a light switch, and I've just taken away all the conditions of life, and then I take alcohol and I put it into my bloodstream. I drink something, mix something into my bloodstream that makes me woozy, so I can't experience the life that is accurately touching every one of my senses at every second. Or I imbibe some plant that gives me hallucinations, that distorts my senses. It's life-denying. And so that was the intoxicants part. That's the last one. So I, I don't know if this makes sense to folks, but the idea that the precepts are life-giving, life-supporting, life-nurturing, and breaking the precepts is the opposite. 
If you kill, it's obvious. If you steal, it's less obvious, but it's real. If you cheat, you're denying the life of society that supports you, your community. If you lie, you're twisting the conditions that support life. And if you mix with your bloodstream intoxicants, you can't merge with the life around you. And as I walk today uh, through, the, through the bush here in Queen, the Queensland bush, I felt like all the conditions were giving me life. The wind, the light, the breeze, the sounds of the birds, the, the earth under my feet was gentle and moist. And I thought, boy, this, this is how it should be. And the generals that are determined to destroy someone else's house and land and bodies and vehicles and streets and sewers and lights. So I'm going to throw a missile into a home, throw a missile into a into a uh, an apartment and just destroy everything you know that is someone who is too far removed from the experience that I had today and if everyone could have the experience of living in a nurturing environment that is mutually supportive you wouldn't want to take that away from someone else for any reason and the idea that the land that I live in is not enough, I need yours too, I need more. My land is not enough, I have to take your land and I will move you out of it. It's just so foreign to the well-being that is available to all of us. And we just don't hear, we don't experience it, so it's an abstraction. So here is the Buddha who is cultivating the paramitas, the tao bi an, the dharmas that cross over from fear and life-denying energies to that place of no fear, that place of confidence and courage, and the place of life-nurturing. giving precepts, patience, vigor, dhyana, and the magic one, prajna, paramita. Um, I was considering what to talk about today, and I was thinking, how can you illustrate prajna, paramita? So, our bodhisattva forest of wisdom, Hui Lin Pusa, is praising the Buddha, praising the Tathagatas. And he's praising the fact that when they were cultivating, they cultivated the paramitas. And paramita, Sanskrit word, to cross over, take across, to reach over. And another way of dividing the word is also perfection. So it's paramita or paramita, the way you divide the Sanskrit. And the idea of the paramitas, these are what bodhisattvas cultivate and are Tathagata cultivated them when he was before he became a Buddha. And the paramitas are cultivated like antidotes. They're what a doctor prescribes. So a paramita is, oh, if you see somebody who's not, who isn't alive to the joy of giving, you teach them how to give. And they, it's an antidote to stinginess and to the fear of clinging and you teach, you allow the person to give and the joy of giving fills their soul and they come alive. So you cross over. The, we just talked about precepts. The, um, when that was always dis, uh, explained in this rhythm, this pattern of you antidote there's an illness and you cure it with an antidote you prescribe a medicine um, 
the parameters are six prescriptions. Think about him as a doctor with prescriptions. Yao Fang, right? So the when it was said, oh, it's you cure the, the disease of uh, dissolution, that never made sense to me. Like xie dai, right? Or uh, the, I don't know what the Chinese is. I don't even know what the English is. How do you say? You cure, with the paramita of precepts, you cure the illness of uh, dissolute, that's the word. That, that never made sense. I couldn't connect it. If we translate it instead as the, di the illness of death dealing, <laughs> uh, denial of life, that makes sense. How does that work? See the precepts as life-giving. That was my awareness today, walking through the, the, uh, the Bodhi Trail, the Bodhi Way. It's just a little, maybe, what, 100 yards walking through the trees. And uh, Dharma Protector Sam, uh, when he was living here, walked through and saw Echidna there. And we've seen, um, what else? There's all kinds of wallabies and kangaroos and uh, all kinds of critters that live. And, and uh, Alex uh, Chin Li, when he was living here, would pass through at night and see all these different, different creatures that live down there. Um, so, if we translate the precepts as the Bodhisattva wants to practice the paramita of precepts, Shila paramita, uh, we can say it is to cure the disease of life denial, leading to death. Chen bai nian lai wan li gong, yeah, for years, countless years, the bitter stew of hate it was boiling on. It's like a bowl of broth that when you drink it, you hate. And the more you live life-denying, the, the bigger the, the soup of hate gets. It's hateful waves are ocean deep, impossible to calm. Once all that hatred, life-denying karma builds up, it boils over. To learn the cause of all this hate, of all this conflict, terror, hate, and war, what do you do? Go to the slaughterhouse. Oh, where do we go? We go to Colinga, California. Oh my goodness. Amitofo. Koalinga, C-O-A-L-I-N-G-A. It's a little town. Um, if you drive from the Bay Area to L.A., Highway 5, you go past Kalinga. No, 101, some 101. Is it on 5? It's on 5. And you, people, the first time you go down, you're driving along. It's, it's in Central California, where Central California becomes Southern California. And you drive along, and this smell comes in the car. And everybody goes, ooh, what's that smell? And you don't see anything because you the smell starts half a mile from where the smell begins. You first encounter the smell half a mile away from the source. You drive that extra half mile and you look to the left if you're going south and here are thousands and thousands of cows. And there's also sheep there. But the cows, it's a stockyard. Kolinga's a meat packing feed lot and the cows just stand out there in the sun and the minders of the cows pour antibiotics and growth hormones and corn and soybeans that cows shouldn't be eating and they pour them into big troughs and the cows eat this and they get fat quick and then all of the excrement that comes off, the minders have to wash it into these troughs that carry it away. They use all this water, drinkable water, to wash off the cows and to keep the, keep the 
urine and excrement moving, where does it go? It goes somewhere, doesn't it? And then the cows get fat and they kill them and ship them off as meat. And the smell of all those animals as you drive by is overpowering. I say it's the first time you do that, that you, you get the smell. The second time you go by, what do you do? You close your windows and you shut the vents of the car so the air doesn't suck in the smell. People learn really quickly that that's awful. That smell is just overpowering, but it's more than a smell. It's an energy. It's a chi of desperation and hopelessness. Those animals know, of course they know. They know from the time they got onto the death trucks and were shipped down to the feedlot from the small farms where they grew, where they were back eating grass the way they're supposed to. Oh my goodness. Anyway, so that's the energy. Yuan shen si hai hen nanping. The hatred is hard to calm in that, that broth of anger and resentment. Oh my. So, and yet, for that little burst of flavor, we go through all of this. Yes, indeed. To learn the cause of all this terror. And as I mentioned this story a couple weeks ago, I was talking this way. I was got onto this topic uh, once in Berkeley with a group that is not a typical sutra, les sutra listening audience. It was the, uh, the Thursday night Vipassana group. I had been invited to speak as a guest and unconsciously uh, unaware I had drifted into the, the way uh, one of the Dharma that I talk about to our ordinary, to, to your, to you all, to this, the sutra lecturing group who by and large are mostly vegetarians, I'm assuming, or are thinking about maybe investigating letting go of meat and picking up a health, healthy plant-based diet. So I was talking about this and I got to this poem and I told, I showed the pig and I showed the, the warfare around the pig and this woman was beside herself with anger. I'll never forget. She said, this is the most outrageous thing I've ever heard. I came to learn how to meditate and you are preaching something, some food. Why are you in my dinner table? That's not what I came to hear. This is, this is ridiculous. Who said that you... She just blew up. And the people around her were like, this, he lives here. This is, you're in his home. This, this monastery is where he lives. You're a guest here. You shouldn't talk like that to the monk. And she, oh, she stood up and stomped out. And I had touched a button. I touched a sore spot. And I understood immediately that, that this person, I, my teaching had broken through. <laughs> and she didn't want to hear because she felt it. And I suspect it might be that... Uh, uh, maybe her husband was a kosher butcher, perhaps. This is a Jewish woman who was a regular meditator, and I, I didn't, it never, I didn't follow up to find out how she, whether she recovered. She didn't come back to make it okay later. I didn't know her story. But I will share another wonderful story um, about... Uh, people whose buttons get pushed in the right way. And it's the story of Gor, of Mo. Mo is also known as, as uh, Professor Ping Pong. He's got a variety of names. So Mo was a Bay Area guy, Jewish guy, who came in to the door of Gold Mountain Monastery because he had affinities with Master Hua and with the Dharma. And so um, Mo was, uh, uh, still is, very uh, outspoken, talkative, and th he thinks out loud. Uh, you can hear his thought processes and the things he says. And uh, Shurfu was 
it was a Saturday afternoon lecture, and here was Mo, and uh, he was just a brand new, like first time in the door, and being an American, intellectual guy, he challenged Shurfu from the audience, and I, I didn't, I can't tell you exactly what. Shurfu was what the topic was of the lecture at the time. I suspect it was um, something to do with changing your diet. And Mo said, uh, when it was time for, he said, can I ask a question? And Shurfu smiled. And Mo said, uh, how can you do, he said, why would you, uh, why would you want to stop eating meat? And Shurfu said, Because, he said, if you can, what does our text say? As if you can cultivate giving precepts, patience, vigor, and dhyana, as well as prajna paramita, he said, if you can do that well, said, when the time comes, you will know exactly what to say to take your father across and get him to stop killing. <laughs> and Mo's, he was speechless. He had nothing to say. And for this guy, that was rare. Mo always had something to say. And after the lecture, Mo came over and bowed to Shurfu and said, uh, um, he said, I, I need to tell you, he said, uh, my father is a butcher and I would do anything if I could get him to stop killing because I know it's affecting his health. How did you know, he said, the sheriff smiled. I didn't know what my disciples are thinking. How could I ever teach anyone, said sheriff. <laughs> oh, you know what your disciples are thinking. Duh. So sheriff said, so, so Mo, within a month, had left home, shaved his head, and was on his way to becoming a monk. And he, he did. He became a, a, he didn't get to bhikshu, but he was a novice monk for a while. So, deep affinities with our teacher and with, but how about that? Shrifu said, if you can cultivate the paramitas to perfection, he said, when the time comes, you will know exactly what to say to take your father across and to get him to stop killing. Shrifu picked it out of, the, out of Mo's mind and gave it to him, just like that. How wonderful. So, now that thing about prajna paramita as well, hmm. prajna paramita is the Mahayana Dharma Supreme. It's the heart of Prajnaparamita literature, which includes the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Sutra, Jingang Jing, Shinji. And Prajnaparamita can sometimes gets uh, portrayed as a in, a, in a form, in a body, portrayed as a woman. The Greeks, the Greek uh, esoteric alchemical traditions celebrated Prajnaparamita as Sophia, wisdom. Hmm, interesting. Um, so Prajnaparamita is one place where Buddha Dharma crosses over into the mystical traditions of other ancient civilizations in the planet. So, um, I've been working on ways to uh, sing praises of Prajnaparamita, and uh, it's coming, it's a work in progress. So, we just did two verses of the sutra. I'm going to share again. Here we go. 
we only did two verses. I was, in fact, I didn't get to what I was planning to talk about today, but um, the topic of the dark of ignorance came up and I launched into a talk about uh, the benefits to the world of a plant-based diet and how sad it is that even the United Nations pointed to it and said of all the, uh, the things that contribute to uh, global warming, to climate change, climate disruption, the harm done to the biosphere by animal agriculture is worse than all of the exhaust coming out of all the, mobile, the motor vehicles in the world. If you take all the cars, all the buses, all the planes, all the ships, all the things that that burn fuel and contribute carbon emissions to the planet, what comes out of the the, the tails, the tail end of animals raised for meat is more harmful. If we could simply uh, not all the, we don't slaughter the animals that are currently doing it, but we don't add to them. We could delay the onset of the climate catastrophes that are happening around the world, and humanity could survive a little longer. Um, this unhappy predictions, we're heading towards a time of refugees, climate refugees. And the number of people who will be pushed off of their land because it's uninhabitable this time next year will be doubled. So, awful. Okay, uh, let's look at them one more time. Ru lai chu shi jian, wei shi chu chi ming. Ru shi shi jian deng, xi you nan ke jian. The Tathagata appears amid the worlds, dispels the dark of ignorance for us all. In this way, we see the lamp of the world so rare and difficult to meet. Well cultivated, giving precepts and patience, vigor and dhyana as well. He has cultivated prajnaparamita, and with these he illumines the mundane world. Ah, may it be so. <sighs> I wanted to... Uh, Once again, bring up our favorite, oh, 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 not that. Bring up our favorite names of the Buddha. Here we are. Right there. Here it is. Uh, some friends from China were saying, oh, I like to sing those names. Good, I'm glad you do. Me too. My sleeve, it keeps hitting my fifth string. There we go. These are the names of the seven Tathagatas. Namo Do Bao Ru Lai, Namo Bao Shan Ru Lai, Namo Mi Sha Shan Ru Lai, Namo Namo libu e rula, namo kandu o rula, namo amito rula, namo doba rula, namo bosham rula, namo nishashim rula, namo kandosham rula, namo libu e rula, namo kandu o rula, namo amito rula. One more. Namo do ba ru lai, namo bao shan ru namo shan shan ru namo guan bo shan ru namo li bu e ru namo kan bu wang ru namo li bu ru
imagine you're walking down the road with uh, keeping singing to keep your steps in t in time, right? What do you do? You go. trying to get the introduction these are the names these are the names of the seven tatagatas these are the names of the seven tatagatas still work on it we'll get there we'll get there okay i'm going to share with you oh first a photograph hope everybody enjoys a photo we've had uh here we go. We've had lots and lots of rain. And when it rains, these guys, here we go. These guys huddle together on my railing and cuddle because it's cold and wet. And we've had a big storm. Rainbow lorikeets, aren't they sweet? Um, there's, we're in a time of Buddhist holidays. I've got my Buddhist calendar here. Turn to July. We just had Guanyin Bodhisattva's Cheng Dao, right? This is our DRBA calendar. Dharma Master Liang and her team put them together every year. Uh, on the 17th of July was Guanyin Bodhisattva's Cheng Dao, day of realizing the way. But when we get into to, uh, August, oh my goodness, August is coming up. And August 7th is going to be Ulambana, Ulampanjie, which is the day of the Buddha's rejoicing, the day that we rescue beings who are hanging upside down. That's Ulambana coming up on the 7th. Uh, that will be the, let's see, that will be our Sunday, let's see, our Monday, uh, California Sunday. Then, that same week, Dashajir Pusa's birthday, the 10th, is Great Strength Bodhisattva. Um, let's see, no, the actual day of Ulambana is the 12th, but we'll celebrate it the weekend before. Then, um, Urstor Bodhisattva, Di Zang Wang Pusa. His actual day of Urstor Bodhisattva's birthday is the 26th of July. And then, I'm sorry, 6th, 26th of August, Ba Yuefen. So, a lot of holidays. We also have Patriarch Pu'an's birthday on the 18th, Venerable Six Patriarchs Nirvana Day on the 29th. So, this is uh, the end of summer, heading towards autumn, is uh, big days for the Buddhist calendar coming up. Um, because of a need in Australia for, we're uh, in a time of major COVID nastiness here in Australia. The hospitals are full. Um, all kinds of surgeries are being postponed. There's just no room. So this uh, Omicron variant has been super contagious and it's taking everybody, including the American president and the chairman of the select January 6th committee, Benny Thompson, uh, all came down with COVID. Luckily, they're vaccinated and boosted, and so it's minimal symptoms. Excuse me while I <laughs> tickle. Um, so here in Australia, in order to accord with the situation, our nuns have volunteered to put together recitation of the Urstor Bodhisattva Sutra. And they're going to be doing it 
for 31, 35 days, they're going to recite 100 volumes of the Earth Store Sutra. Yao Song, Di Zhang Jing Yi Bai Bu, in 35 days, which means three times a day, along with um, bowing the Earth Store Bodhisattva repentance. So you can join in. Here's the schedule. You can see um, time of day. So Saturdays and Sundays, it's 8.30 to 10. Monday to Friday, 7 to 8.30 in the morning. Then 1.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon. And then 7 to 8.30 in the evening. Now, I need to tell you, this is Australian time. This is Australian Eastern Standard Time, which is um, two hours faster than Taiwan, China, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia, I can't say for sure. Um, so in America, it's 18, 16 hours different. So it's a difficult, uh, it's... You have to check, you have to have your Time Buddy app on your phone ready to go. If you would like to join in, and this is the good part, you can take part. We're inviting you to take part three times a day as the nuns chant. And here is the Zoom link. Um, I will, let's see, uh, Jerry, maybe you can photograph that. Can I send it? I think I can send it in the chat, and then you could post it or share it. But folks are welcome. May Zhou Liu, Zhou Ri, Mei Tian Bang Wan, Shi Jie, Shi Jian, Shi Duan, live on Zoom every weekend and every evening. So the evenings, it's it's midnight in America, right? But it's good timing for Asia. Here is the link. This is the um, the Zoom ID one two seven five nine eight nine four two. You can join. You can join right in and listen. You can also li pai wei if you want to set up a pai wei. Pray for blessings for crossing over the deceased. Okay. Um, let's see. I will. I'm going to send that in the chat. So let's see if there's any way that, um, hold on, send it to everybody here. How do I do that? I have to put it in the Dropbox. Um, maybe I won't try to do that. But maybe, maybe I can drag and drop. What do you say? Is that possible? Nope. So, uh, Cliff, maybe you can find a way to uh, send that over so that we can share that with folks um, and let them know how to join in. Okay, so that's the idea. That's going to be a chance to in and recite the Urstor Sutra along with the nuns and the community here at Gold Coast Dharma Realm. If you would like to um, simply listen, uh, if you'd like to set up a pieway, there's opportunities to do so. So 100 volumes of the Erstro Sutra for 35 days is going to be recited here. That's good news. Goodness for the world. Uh, if you've never recited the Erstro Sutra, you're on your own. It is a powerful experience as I can testify personally. So highly recommended. Um, beginners, be aware that there's a lot of strong dharma in the Earth Store Sutra. Uh, you can direct your questions to us. Okay, there you go, upcoming. Yes, it's on the website. Excellent, excellent, good. Find that on the website, gcdr, Gold Coast Dharma Realm, gcdr.org.au for Australia. That's the way to find it. Good stuff. All right. I would like to now invite, there it is. I'd like to invite the Bhikshus, the Berkeley Monastery. Let me bring up 
my I gotta type in the website berkeleymonastery.org then I'll share my screen and invite you to let us know what's happening at Berkeley Monastery. Jin Chuan Jin, are you sure? Are you there? Yeah. yeah. Great. Tofu. Great. Tell me tofu. So yeah, we're happy to be back. We just got back from Guru Farm. And so you can see on the first uh, announcement, we are resuming our daily ceremonies online. So morning and evening ceremonies will resume from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. and 6.30 to 7.30 or 7.50 p.m. And if you really want, you can also watch our recordings uh, there uh, if we happen not to be around. So yes, there's a schedule here of our program. Some of them are on break for the summer, but you can get a sense of all the things that we do in the monastery. So if you want to have a day of practice online in the monastery, you can do it. <laughs> Actually, quite a few people have been joining regularly. Okay, great. So the next is um, also, if you scroll down, Jing Fo Shi, oh no, Dharma Master's Sutra Lecture on Fridays is 1 to 2 p.m. We updated the website because the time of the lecture was moved back 30 minutes. So if you would like to listen to the Song of Enlightenment from 1 to 2, please join in. Then we have our afternoon recitation with Dharma Master Jing Fo every day except Fridays, 1230 to 1. That way those who are listening to the Sutra Lecture can do so at 1 o'clock. Um, the other announcement that's been ongoing is We've opened our monastery a little bit on Thursdays and Fridays, our daily meditation. So if you'd like to, uh, please join in. We do ask people to please wear masks still inside and um, you know, be vaccinated and maintain social distancing. They also have to register, right? Yes. Once. Well, register once. Register once. Well, we, have a, we also have a sign-in at the monastery, so you can show up and sign in. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, we have the Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Merit, uh, July 31st, 2022, which is next Sunday, not tomorrow, but the following week, 6.30 to 7.30, we sign the Great Compassion Mantra. That's been ongoing, and I think we always almost always have about a quarter of a million recitations wow. every month. So, wow. yeah, please join in if you like. There's a link there for the form, and you can register and join in on the recitation but if you don't want to register to recite no problem you can still join in the, the event and recite the great compassion mantra with the with the monks here at the monastery yeah okay and i think that's the main events but we also i think the loka vihara nuns are still doing their dharma events online okay. and you can join it uh via the their link which is on their website all right Great. Okay, how was Buddha Root Farm? <laughs> uh, the title was Sanctuary of the Heart, and definitely being out in the Oregon forest, reciting Guan Yin Bodhisattva's name was a chance to get in touch with our hearts. And with the nature. And with nature. Like Dharma Master, you were sharing about how you were observing how the you were supported by the earth and, and get to breathe the fresh air. Mm -hmm. and you definitely get that sense there at Oregon. Indeed. And it seems that the animals slowly kind of bring the trust to us. We have a wonderful experience the one day all together outside, eat lunch, and two deers appear. Two deer. Enjoy. Two deer. deer. Yeah. Uh -huh. And for 45 minutes, they <laughs> eat with us and the relatively close distance. What was wow. quite amazing. Yeah, and I, you know, I tend to think they might not have done that if you had been putting off uh, meat-eating vibes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we had a gun or something, they probably wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, how nice, how nice, great. It was one of our insights that in the kitchen anywhere in the monastery there was no smell of meat for them, so it was your point in the lecture. Mm-hmm. Maybe the animals trust more these two legs creatures. 
Yeah. It's dangerous. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Well, I, I got one more to share here. Thank, I appreciate all your uh, the events that are happening, and I hope people will uh, dive in and and take an, you know uh, take, take advantage of what you have going. Um, I'm looking for. Let's see. Uh, oh, maybe I won't try to do it. Um, I went out into the the photos coming back from the Webb telescope and uh, during my Song of Enlightenment lecture talked about uh, how when you look at that nature can be a gateway into infinity. Uh, that as a kid I used to lie my back on the grass at night and look up at the stars and try to count them and and your mind very quickly goes beyond the limits of your own body. You just think, how could, how could I be so concerned about my own well-being when, look, you know, and it's, it's real, and it's, it's just, it has no end. It just goes on and on and on and on. And I am one tiny portion of this, this totality, and my own problems shrink. They just become so comparatively so unimportant by looking up. And now this Webb telescope that is uh, out a million miles and is able to penetrate using uh, infrared light, penetrate through the cloud of dust that is usually between us and how far we want to see. And uh, so it was easy to draw the comparison between the, the Tathagata's ability to shatter the darkness of the world and you see, oh, this telescope lets us go beyond the dust that, of space into uh, a time and a space that we'd never seen before. Humanity's never seen that far. And uh, so it was great to look at those photos, and I was going to uh, uh, bring them up. I, I won't try to do it now, but when you think um, one of the things that, that probably the major source of obstruction for a mind that wants to see that far would be the karma of killing. Um, to say, uh, you know, oh, here we go. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, Jerry has typed in the, uh, uh, the link if you want to go out and look for yourself, uh, the, the images. Here's one. The one that I was using was uh, Smax0273. Let me share my screen so you can see what I was talking about. Here it is right here. So this is one of the images that is, um, so we figured out to go one light year, if you wanted to, this is 92 billion light years away. If you want to go one, if you wanted to travel, if you could jump onto the Discovery shuttle, the space shuttle, and ride it out, it goes, look at this galaxy here, Little, that's just one of them. The space shuttle would take you, it goes five, shoot, I, I shouldn't misquote it. To go one light year would take 37,200 years of our, the distance that light travels in a year is would take us, if we wanted to cover it on, you know, putting your body there, you'd have to go 37,200 years. And you think, well, I'm only going to live not more than 100, you know. Yeah, well, so 37,200 of those, it would take you to go one light year. And these are billions of light years away. And this telescope now lets us see out there. We'd never gone that far with our eyes. And each one of these is a galaxy. And, you know, you think, yeah, yeah, my goodness, my problems. It seems so important. <laughs> Quite amazing. And this is nature and this is real. This is reality. And it doesn't end. It keeps on traveling. And so when I think, wow, the Buddha Dharma lets me approach wisdom that could maybe understand this or grasp it with my own senses. 
ah, I want to get real wisdom so I can experience this, you know, <laughs> and get and yet the self, the power of the self to limit my perception of this is so huge. How sad, you know, that I'm still trapped in the prison of my skandhas and unable to see this. So, anyway, so that was that was uh, quite wonderful to uh, use the uh, the verse from Song of Enlightenment, which is Master Yong Jia's celebration of how he uh, says nature is the gateway to appreciate the wisdom of the Buddha. So, okay, anyway, there we go. Thank you, uh, Dharma Master Jin Chuan Jinwei, for sharing Berkeley Monastery's schedule. And uh, hope everybody will take advantage of uh, the opportunity to join with the nuns at Gold Coast Dharma Realm to uh, recite the Restore Bodhisattva Sutra. And Restore's holiday is coming up next month. So, the last thing, we haven't transferred merit. We have to do that still. So I would like to invite everybody to, um, here, let me unshare my screen and bring up our Medicine Buddha mantra, which is Mahayana Buddhism's own power tool. Let's see, let me bring it up here. There it is that gives us something to do in the face of COVID. That's the benefit of this mantra is it uh, allows us to actually do something um, powerful and effective to in, in the face of COVID-19's invasion of our bodies and our atmosphere. Stronger than COVID, stronger than a virus, is Medicine Buddha's vows and the vibrations of this mantra. So, can we transfer the merit? Thank you for joining to this week again um, into our investigation of the verses and praise in a palace of the Suyama heaven, the Avatamska Sutra. That's already wonderful. And to be able to take that energy and send it out to the universe transformed through the vibrations of this mantra, you got something to do. This is proactive spiritual medicine for healing. Here we go.
I feel healthier already. I'm going to invite you to join me in bowing to the Buddhas as we say goodbye to our sutra for another week. Here we go. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Okay, that's going to do it for us for today. See you all next week. Aomi Tofu. Bye, everybody.